Poor folks like you should just stand and watch. I was looking forward to my only daughter's big day at her wedding, but her mother-in-law said this to me. I was shocked because I never expected to be told to just stand and watch. However, I'm not someone who lets things go without a response. My daughter, Jessica, is a lot like me in that regard. She doesn't let things slide either. That's why she stood up, confident and strong, and said, Mom, let's go. Yes, let's. There's no need to linger in a place like this. Besides, it seems this in-law family has no clue about their place. Since we're here, we might as well teach them a lesson. From now on, we won't be passive anymore. Our counterattack begins now. Watching her mother-in-law go half crazy within 10 minutes of our retaliation made me think, serves her right, but I have no intention of letting up just yet. If they think they'll keep ruling the roost, they've got another thing coming. My name is Trish. I'm turning 65 this year, but I'm still going strong. I work as a master brewer at a craft brewery. When you think of a master brewer, you probably picture a man. But nowadays, I'm glad to say, more women are entering the field. I used to be an ordinary woman, far removed from the world of craft brewing, but one TV show changed my life. After graduating from college, I got a job at a regular company. I met someone at work, and after an office romance, my daughter Jessica was born. Fortunately, I was able to take full maternity and parental leave, which allowed me to focus entirely on raising her. There was no greater happiness than spending time with Jessica as she grew up, but in quiet moments, I began to feel a small sense of unease, wondering if this was all there was to my life. My life was smooth sailing. I had a lovely child and a good job. Friends often envied me, but during my child's nap times, a sense of emptiness would sometimes creep in. It was as if a hole had opened up inside me. One day, while Jessica was napping, I was watching TV and got completely hooked on a program about craft brewing. The man being interviewed had originally been a businessman, but left his job to pursue his ideal craft beer. Listening to him talk, I felt a stirring in my chest. This might be what I've been looking for. My father was a craft beer lover, and when I lived at home, we would have a drink together almost every day. We would savor the different temperatures, pairings, and flavors. Each had its own unique depth and aroma. At the time, I drank without much thought, but looking back, I realized how remarkable it was. I was surprised by the depth of it all. Of course, I knew that the world of craft brewing was a male-dominated one, with only a handful of female master brewers. But that's exactly why I began to want to create craft beer that women could enjoy drinking. My family was supportive of my career change, helping with housework and picking up Jessica from daycare, something I still appreciate today. Thanks to their support, I was able to get a job at a craft brewery in the next town over. That town is known for having many breweries, and I found one that was looking to start something new. While I started from the bottom as an office worker and tour guide, 
I studied the ins and outs of craft brewing every day. Since I've always enjoyed studying things I'm interested in, I found a sense of fulfillment in this work that I hadn't felt before. But one day, my husband fell ill and passed away. He had supported and encouraged my desire to make craft beer, so I couldn't let his support go to waste. I worked desperately and finally became one of the few female master brewers in the country. I remember being overjoyed when I reached that milestone. Since I was a newcomer to the role, and female master brewers were not as common as they are now, my name didn't get much recognition. But it didn't matter to me whether my name was known or not. As long as the beer I poured my heart into reached the world and brought joy to many people, I couldn't ask for anything more. As my career took off, good news came in my personal life as well. Mom, I have someone I want to introduce to you. Jessica said to me shyly. I met him at a local event the other day, and this is the first time I'm introducing someone to you who isn't just a friend. Not just a friend? I caught on immediately from that one word. Wait, you don't mean? Yes, he's a wonderful man, and I can really see myself being with him for the long haul. I'm sure you'll like him too, Mom. On the day Jessica said that, I went to the meeting place and saw a man standing beside her. He was tall, with an impressive, dignified demeanor. Mom, this is the man I'm dating, John. The man, John, looked at me and greeted me with a warm smile. It was a perfect, movie star-like smile that he flashed at me. Although he said he was 40, with such a smart and graceful manner, I was sure women wouldn't be able to resist him. I'm so glad you could make it today. I've been wanting to meet you for some time now. We met at a local event. I never expected to meet such a wonderful person there, so I think it was fate. Oh, don't flatter me. You stood out to me right away in that crowd, Jessica. It seemed like they were reminiscing about how they met, and suddenly they started getting all lovey devey. Jessica had never had much to do with men before and was always focused on her work. As a parent, I was thrilled she had found someone she loved so much that she couldn't help but gush about him. During our chat, I found out that John is an only son and that he's likely to take over the family business in the future because he works locally. Oh, you have a family business? Yes, though it's nothing too impressive. If you don't mind, could I ask what kind of work it is? We run an inn. Lately, it's been getting busier, so I might have to step up as the next president soon. At that moment, Jessica suddenly went silent. It's wonderful that you're already thinking about your future. Since we just met, I decided to play it safe and stick to polite small talk. Well, because of that, Jessica has been helping out with our family business quite a bit. I guess you could call it training to be the lady of the inn. John said this with a smile as he took a sip of tea. At that moment, I thought I noticed Jessica's expression stiffen for a split second. Seeing that look, I had a bad feeling. Helping out, what do you mean? As I asked, John gently interrupted me. Oh, it's nothing major. But since I'm at the age where I need to think about the future, I'd like to welcome Jessica into our family officially. John's quick, almost rehearsed response left me with little room to interject. 
Is that so? Yes, and Jessica has been kind enough to agree to help out. We're so grateful for her willingness to be involved with the family, so she'll feel right at home. Jessica is just an ordinary person. She graduated from a local university, works at an office, and spends her weekends shopping or going out with friends. Nothing about her particularly stands out, which made this whole situation seem odd to me. Now that I think about it, I haven't had a single direct conversation with Jessica during this entire tea gathering. By the way, Jessica, before I could finish my sentence, John cut me off again. Hey Jessica, we're going to my mom's place after this, right? She's really excited about helping you pick out a dress. Yes, of course. A dress? Does that mean? We've been talking about having the wedding this year. If we don't book the venue soon, all the popular spots will be gone. John said this clearly, looking me straight in the eye with the cheerful smile. People say that a wedding is a big commitment. That's why we want to make sure it's a special day in a special place, surrounded by those who matter most. My parents are already pretty enthusiastic about it. I was surprised that they were already discussing wedding plans, but at the same time, I felt like I finally understood what had been bothering me. I realized what was wrong. Whenever I tried to talk to Jessica, John would jump in, almost as if he didn't want me to speak to her directly. Is there something he doesn't want me to know? Even when I tried to read Jessica's expression, she didn't seem particularly upset or concerned, so I couldn't figure out what was going on. Please look forward to our wedding. I'm sure it will be a wonderful day for you as well. We'll let you know once the details are finalized. The fact that John said, we'll let you know, made it clear that his family was planning everything. I wanted to see how Jessica felt about all of this, but her face was partially hidden by her hair, so I couldn't get a good look. I would come to regret not forcing a moment to talk directly with Jessica at that time. One day, a letter arrived from both Jessica and John informing me of a family dinner to be held before the wedding. Since it was the off-season at work, I was flexible enough to attend the dinner, so I didn't mind the date they had chosen, but I felt it would have been nice if they'd at least asked me before setting the date. Trying to push down this uneasy feeling, I reached out to Jessica to confirm a few details. I wanted to ask what to wear, whether I should bring a gift, and so on. Lately, she hadn't even called me, which was strange. When I finally called her, it took ten rings before she answered, and she spoke in a hushed voice, as if she didn't want to be overheard. Apparently, she was at work and couldn't talk, but she promised to call me back later, I apologized for interrupting her work and hung up quickly, but Jessica never called back. Instead, I got a call from John. Did you get the invitation to the dinner? Yes, it arrived two days ago. I wanted to discuss the dress code and what gift to bring for your family, so I called Jessica, but... Oh, don't worry about any of that. Just come as you are. With that, John ended the call. Jessica still hadn't contacted me, and whenever I spoke to John, he would just tell me not to worry and to come as I am. In the end, on the day of the dinner, I wore a simple blouse and slacks and brought a well-known brand of cookies as a gift. 
I had considered bringing some of the beer I made, but I thought it might be too surprising for them to receive beer from someone they just met, so I decided to save it for another occasion. When I entered the room where the dinner was to be held, everyone except me was already seated. Across from Jessica sat John and two people who I assumed were his parents. Nice to meet you. I'm Susan, John's mother. It's a pleasure to finally meet you. At first glance, her outfit wasn't flashy, but each piece was of high quality. And more than anything, she had a certain aura about her. The poised, commanding presence she exuded was something I could see reflected in John as well, and I couldn't help but be oddly convinced of their connection. Nice to meet you. Oh, I've always wanted a daughter, so I'm so happy Jessica's joining our family. I remember feeling relieved when I met her. As I'd heard that she only had her mother, I was wondering what kind of person she would be. The way she spoke was irritating as she kept saying things that didn't sit well with me. Well, we're planning the wedding soon and getting everything ready. It's going to be a fantastic day to celebrate their new beginning. You're going to love it. Susan seemed absolutely thrilled while her husband just laughed heartily and occasionally sipped his drink without contributing much to the conversation. Oh, and about the gift money, we'll do without it. She suddenly brought up money and I hesitated, unsure of how to respond. Susan continued, uh, a gift money? Oh, do you mean you can't send her off without one? I didn't realize there were still families like that these days. So, how much are you asking for? Susan glanced at me sharply. No, we hadn't even considered that. We'll go along with whatever you prefer. She covered her mouth with a handkerchief, but I could still see the sly smile she was trying to hide. And of course, She'll need to give us a grandson at some point, too. The outdated expectations she expressed made my skin crawl. After that unpleasant dinner, my desire to avoid seeing John and his parents only grew stronger. Two weeks after that dinner, I received a message from John saying, We registered our marriage today. I would have preferred to hear this news directly from Jessica, but I suppose she's busy since she's quit her job and is now helping out at the inn, training to be the perfect bride. Still, I'm surprised at how arrogant John's family is, despite being the owners of a group of inns in the area. I'll attend the wedding because I want to see Jessica looking beautiful on her big day. But after that, I'd rather keep my distance from them. Even after the family meeting, I still couldn't reach Jessica by phone, and I would only get a few short texts late at night. Whenever I asked her anything, her response was always, Sorry. I've been too busy to call. The brevity of her messages made me uneasy, like she was sending telegrams. At least I managed to find out the time and location of the wedding, but beyond that, I was completely in the dark. Despite getting married, Jessica didn't seem to have any of the joy or excitement one would expect from a bride. Is she really okay with this wedding? Even though Jessica has always been a bit reserved, I thought she might at least show some excitement about her wedding day. But on the morning of the wedding, I was still filled with worry. When I arrived at Jessica and John's wedding venue, I couldn't find my seat. I was fumbling around trying to figure it out when the ceremony began. 
As I hurried over to the family seating area, Susan approached me. Poor folks like you should just stand and watch. I was so taken aback that I couldn't comprehend what was happening. I never said you could sit, especially not in the family section. She looked at me with an expression that clearly said she couldn't believe what I was doing. Other people nearby just watched without stepping in to help. And some even had their cameras out as if they were excited to catch something entertaining. The audacity of it all was staggering. I never imagined that, at my age, I would be treated this way. It was as if Susan had planned this, anticipating my confusion. The other guests, all wearing matching ties and handkerchiefs bearing the inn's logo, glanced at me out of the corner of their eyes, as if waiting for my reaction. Some of them, who seemed to be employees from the inns, were even pouring beer for each other. As I looked closer, I realized they were drinking the beer from my own brewery. Something snapped inside me when I saw that. Noticing my reaction, Jessica stood up tall. The way she rose from the head table was so confident and poised that I couldn't help but admire her, even as her mother. Mom, let's go. Jessica walked over to me and spoke with a calm determination. I followed her lead and stood up. Yes, let's. I began walking toward the head table. I thought John glanced over at me for a moment, but I couldn't care less. I went straight to the drink bar next to it. I grabbed a large bottle of beer. The drink bar offered other drinks too, like wine and high-quality fruit juices. Jessica signaled to an attendant nearby, asking them to bring a container. I knew exactly what I needed to do. I started gathering all the bottles of beer from the drink bar and placing them in the container the attendant brought over. Then I asked the staff to carry the container outside. What do you think you're doing? I won't allow you to behave like this. Oh, do you want the beer that badly, Jessica's mom? Oh, I get it. You need the cheap stuff to get through this, don't you? Well, go ahead, take it. I calmly pulled out a piece of paper and a checkbook from my bag. I can't leave this beer with people who don't appreciate its value or take care of it. I then wrote down the official price of the beer on the check I had brought with me. I carefully crafted this beer and brought it as a special contribution to the wedding. I apologize if it's out of place. What's this supposed to be? A poor person writing a check? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And what do you mean by carefully crafted? I didn't hear anything about that. John was visibly upset, looking utterly ridiculous, while Susan glared at me from the relative's seats, waving her handkerchief. But I wasn't afraid anymore. As the creator of this beer, I can't leave it with people who don't understand its value. It's too painful to watch, so I'll be taking it back. What? The creator? What are you talking about? Susan's hand, which had been wildly waving the handkerchief, suddenly froze as she began to comprehend what I was saying. Without missing a beat, I continued. I'm the one who made this beer. As a master brewer, it's like my own child, carefully nurtured. I can't stand by and let it be mistreated, and as Jessica's mother, I can't tolerate this level of humiliation. This can't be true. 
That beer is from the brewery our inn always uses, and the master brewer was an old man, wasn't he? I'm the one running things as the next master brewer. Not knowing who you're dealing with shows a lack of interest in your own business relationships. The beer I held was one I had crafted specifically for this wedding. It's something special that comes around once in decades. I had made it with the hope that it would be worthy of celebrating my beloved daughter's new beginning. It was one of the few bottles made with a premium label and a serial number, something you wouldn't normally find in stores or bars. The guests who recognized the premium label were buzzing with excitement. It turns out that the beer I created, inspired by Jessica's wedding, had become known among enthusiasts as a legendary brew. Some guests had genuinely wanted to enjoy it. But I couldn't allow that as both the creator of the beer and as a mother. Please, calm down. Calm down. What do you mean by that? Well, you see, a lot of guests are watching. Just relax, okay? Please, have a seat. As he said this, he seemed to realize there wasn't a seat for me and began whispering to an attendant nearby, instructing them to place a chair in the family section. I could see everything from where I was standing. I couldn't stay silent any longer. Why did you even hold this wedding? I asked, looking John straight in the eye. Well, a wedding is to announce our marriage to everyone and to thank our parents for everything they've done. Oh, how wonderful. I'm so glad you turned out to be such a considerate child. Susan chimed in, expressing her joy without a hint of restraint. I understand now. John, looking relieved, turned to me with a microphone in hand. I'm glad you understand, Jessica's mom. Now please, take your seat. We have a ceremony to get on with. He tried to usher me to my seat as if nothing had happened. I couldn't understand how he expected me to sit quietly through the ceremony. That's when Jessica stood up. I can't stay silent any longer. Jessica stared directly at John, her eyes unwavering. John, seeking support, looked to Jessica. Jessica, please, say something. Your mom seems really upset, and if this continues, it's going to be a problem for all the guests. He glanced nervously at the guests, but Jessica spoke with resolve. I've decided that I can't spend my life with you. And for everyone here, I'm sorry, but we're not actually married. The guests erupted in murmurs. After all, this was supposed to be a wedding celebration, and now she was saying they weren't married. But Jessica stood there with confidence, undeterred by the reactions around her. With an air of confidence that she had done nothing wrong, Jessica turned to John and began to speak. And here's proof she said, holding up some papers labeled dormitory contract. The photos Jessica showed us were shocking, like something out of a strict school rulebook, outlining detailed regulations, penalties, and even how to spend free time. When you showed me around the inn, I thought something was off with the employees. I never imagined it was because of these rules. The more I looked at the documents, the more unbelievable the company policies seemed. Rules like, all cell phones are collected during work hours, PCs and phones are only allowed with permission in the dorm, and no social media use. Even today's high schoolers would find such rules unbearable. 
You were just trying to keep anything unfavorable out of the public eye, weren't you? And given the way you've been handling the books, I doubt you can talk your way out of this. No, this is all a misunderstanding, Jessica. But Jessica cut him off, looking as if she couldn't bear to listen any longer. She took off her necklace, brooch, and other accessories, placing them in front of John. I thought it was strange that our inn had such glowing reviews, but now I see it was because you silenced your workers. Manipulating information to boost sales is disgraceful. No, wait, just listen to me. Maybe I'll listen after you hear this. Jessica then played a recording on her phone. You can't even do this, right? What's wrong with you? I might just send you back to your family. Last night, you were messing with your phone in the middle of the night, right? If you can't focus on your work, you can leave. But if you quit here, good luck finding another job with your skills. The harsh voices of Susan and John continued, berating an employee. Hey, can I dock this one's pay? I can put that money to better use as my allowance. Of course, John. Buy yourself something nice. I can't stand to even look at this useless maid. Their yelling went on and on. What if more people found out about this? John and Susan stood there, unable to respond. John looked at me with a face that begged for mercy. But after everything that had happened, I wasn't about to let up. Hey, John. Remember when we first met and you started giving me jewelry and gifts? Why did you do that? Well, I was trying to win you over, of course. Then do you remember saying this? She took out an obviously expensive-looking wallet, necklace, and brooch from her pouch, and she placed them on the table. Didn't you say something like this? It's no big deal for me to buy stuff like this is. John's face turned pale in an instant. What? No, that can't be. It's got to be a joke. I wish it were a joke, but unfortunately, it isn't. Jessica operated her phone and sent images to the guests' phones. You used it to buy me gifts, right? The account books from that time look strange. Strange? You're imagining things. It's not just that time. You've been cooking the books pretty often, haven't you? I figured it out when you made me work at the inn under the guise of training to be the lady of the house. John and Susan turned even paler. You've been doing a pretty sloppy job with the books. Was the gift strategy to keep me, your potential bride, happy? It was clear from the distant seats that their faces were draining of color. It must have been serious. Hey, what do you think this number means? Jessica held a ledger in front of John. What? What is this? And how did you get your hands on this notebook? It's the financial ledger. You insisted that everything should be recorded by hand in a notebook. Jessica flipped through the pages of the notebook she held, stopping at one particular page. Who was it that said I needed to learn to read ledgers if I wanted to become the lady of the house? No, that's not what I meant. Susan's voice was noticeably shaky as she tried to come up with an excuse. It was clear that she knew about John's embezzlement and wasteful spending. This, there's no talking your way out of this. This can't be happening. The notebook detailed the movement of money in great detail. The amounts here don't match up with the amounts over there, and the size of these discrepancies is far from normal. Look, as long as the numbers are close enough, it's fine. You just don't get how to take a relaxed approach, Jessica. 
You try to be too precise, and that's where you go wrong. John spoke as if he knew better. Well, I worked in accounting, and I can't just ignore discrepancies like these. If you overlook even small errors, they'll come back to bite you later. Jessica shoved the notebook back at John. You can't just judge our in based on some accounting notebook from your company. What? Are you serious right now? Even John seemed to realize he couldn't continue this conversation any longer and finally fell silent. Fooling around with money and wasting it is something I absolutely cannot tolerate. So when you told me to file our marriage license, I tore it up. What? It doesn't matter how great you are or how prestigious your family is. I won't become family with someone who messes with money and causes others to feel distrust or anxiety. With that, Jessica delivered her final words and left the venue. She really is my daughter, strong-willed and unwavering. John, clearly panicking, hesitantly approached me. Hey, Jessica was just joking earlier, right? There's no way she'd cancel the wedding after all this, right? What are you talking about? I asked, looking him directly in the eye. Come on, think about it. She's marrying me. She could live a secure life. And if she called it off now, wouldn't that be a kind of betrayal? John looked at me with a smug expression. I respect her thoughts and decisions. It has nothing to do with it being a wedding. About 10 minutes after Jessica told me, Mom, we're leaving, Susan went into a frenzy. How dare you treat us this way? Enough of this nonsense. You're just a craft beer maker. The smug smile Susan had worn earlier was completely gone as she flew into a rage. I don't do business with people I can't trust. Goodbye. In the end, we completely cut ties with John's Inn. I didn't want to sell my carefully crafted beer to people who treated it so carelessly. Jessica managed to say her goodbyes to John properly. At first, she was captivated by him, but eventually, she saw the truth. I know from my own experience how hard it can be to see what's wrong when you're in the thick of it. But nothing good comes from staying in an environment where you can't respect yourself. I'm relieved that Jessica realized what was going on through this experience. Mom, I'm sorry for all the trouble I caused. It's okay. The important thing is that you saw the truth. Besides, I never imagined the beer I created would be treated like that. Jessica left the inn and broke up with John, and since that day, she's been focused on finding a new job. Luckily, she found a new position quickly and seems to be enjoying her days at her new workplace. As for me, I'm still making craft beer. We're about to launch a new series for the first time in years, and the brewery has been busy day and night. Although there's no time to rest, I'm enjoying the work, so it's all good. This time, I'll be the face of the new series for the first time, which brings its own pressure. As a female master brewer crafting delicate craft beer, I'm determined to give it my all. The concept and aim of the product hit the mark, and the beer I created became a huge hit. As I started appearing in magazines, brochures, and even on TV, something I had feared finally happened. Shortly after arriving at work one day, a male employee stopped me. 
telling me that a woman was sitting at the guest entrance and refusing to leave until she saw me. Okay, I'll go check it out. When I went to the guest entrance, I couldn't believe who was there. Finally, you're here. Arriving like a big shot, huh? I guess that's what happens when you're a famous female master brewer. Don't think you can humiliate me and still do business as usual around here. I've been ordering from this brewery since the previous generation. I could even offer you a big contract again. They were talking big, but they looked much more worn out than the last time I saw them. Their clothes, covered in lint, stains, and tears, made me feel sorry for them. Are you listening? I figured your brewery must be struggling without our inn's business, so I'm giving you a chance. How about responding? If you apologize now, I might consider continuing our business as before. You know what'll happen if you waste this opportunity, right? I took a deep breath and spoke to John. You are neither customers nor business partners. I expect you to stop this kind of disruptive behavior immediately. Susan grabbed my shoulder, almost as if she was about to attack me. How dare you speak to me like that? Do you know your place? She probably doesn't, Mom. She didn't get much education, so she doesn't know how to speak properly. Besides, this old brewery is bound to fail soon. Their sheer arrogance was astounding, but I knew that if I didn't put a stop to this, they'd continue behaving the same way. I know you've been lurking around the employee entrance and peeking into the guest entrance several times. I also know you took products from the gift shop for brewery visitors. No, that's just. This behavior was so blatant that I had to consult the police. After installing cameras, we caught clear evidence of your disruptive actions. With this much evidence, I'm sure you understand what comes next. When I turned to face Susan and John, their expressions were unlike anything I'd seen before. Well, uh... That's a dirty trick. It was clear they had no intention of apologizing. Their pride wouldn't allow them to apologize to someone they looked down on. Oh well. I guess there's nothing more to say. I'm going back to work. Huh? But... Anyway, I'll take my leave now. With that, I walked away from them and returned to my work. Afterward, I took the security footage, recorded conversations, and the store's shoplifting records to the police for consultation. As a result, Susan and John's actions were deemed malicious, and they ended up with criminal records. Naturally, the reputation of John's inn group took a hit as well. The inn business had already been struggling due to declining tourism, but this scandal among the management only made things worse. With so many bad reviews on travel sites, it's only a matter of time before the inn goes under. But that's none of my concern. I'm finally free of Susan and John's problems, and I've regained peace in my life. The craft beer I made has become a huge sensation, even attracting international tourists, which makes me incredibly happy as a creator. Now that our shipments are increasing and the brewery's name is becoming more recognized, I'm more motivated than ever to continue creating beer that people will enjoy.